Our presenter tonight is Dr. Mike Coffin. He's an oceanographer at the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. And through the marvel of modern technology, he's joining us live from Australia, where it's early tomorrow morning. Um, hopefully he's had a chance to have a cup of tea or coffee. So his presentation today is gonna to look at the connection between volcanoes, iron and phytoplankton in the Southern Ocean near Antarctica, which are three things that at a glance might seem quite disparate from each other, but Mike will explore with us the fascinating way in which these interact. Um, thank you, Mike, so much for making time to speak to us tonight and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Pip, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm very happy to be able to present remotely um, at the MDIBL, and we'll launch right into it. So what you see behind you is Australia's only active volcano. It's on the island called Heard Island, in the deep in the Southern Ocean. And that's sort of the centerpiece of my presentation, the reason we went to this part of the world. So I'm gonna share my screen with you now for the presentation. So it takes a village to do science. And <clears throat> like, <clears throat> like any big science project, I have a whole team of people who've, who've worked on this project with me. Um, we have 40 people at sea and we probably had another uh, 20 or so investigators ashore. So it's a large project, um, total budget of around $8 million. So to get that kind of resource, we need to put together the best people in the world to get the funding to do it. <clears throat> so I acknowledge all these people, all my co-authors on this, on this work. So what will we go out to do? Well, we set off to test a hypothesis that iron that's mobilized by the cooling of volcanoes, which we call hydrothermal activity, from active volcanoes under the sea actually nourish phytoplankton growth in the Southern Ocean. And phytoplankton need iron to metabolize. And because the Southern Ocean is basically anemic, we need to have sources of iron. And our hypothesis was that actually the cooling of volcanoes, when sub seafloor of these volcanoes cool, they circulate very hot fluids and these fluids pick up metals and compounds, iron being of the most important one, but many others. And you've probably seen images of black smoker vents at mid-ocean ridges where the water coming out or the fluids coming out are 350 degrees centigrade. That's exactly the kind of fluid that we were looking for uh, that could put iron into the water column so phytoplankton could use them. Phytoplankton are important. They produce about half the oxygen in our atmosphere. So every second breath we take is thanks to phytoplankton. We generally think of terrestrial vegetation, trees and grasses as producing nearly all of our oxygen, but the ocean is incredibly important in supplying the earth with oxygen. And what type of phytoplankton do we have in the Southern Ocean? Uh, well, the different kinds of plankton live in different parts of the ocean, but in the Southern Ocean, the dominant form of phytoplankton are diatoms and cockleliths. Uh, diatoms in particular in the deep Southern Ocean because they're very cold water organisms and they like um, <clears throat> the cold waters that encircle the continent of Antarctica. They're incredibly diverse. There are over 200 genera. There are more than 100,000 species. And I'm gonna to return to this towards the end of the talk because we got a bit of a surprise when we actually looked at the biological communities. What's preserved in the fossil record, um, diatoms produce silica bearing shells. And when they die, they sink to the seafloor and they accumulate a sediment that's silica rich because it's made of their shells. Um, that's what we see in the geological record when we take cores or do drilling um, in the Southern Ocean. But we had a surprise when we actually looked in the water column around her, and I'll talk about that later. Evolution of this project. Um, these are long-term major efforts to get going. Uh, my idea was stimulated in 2008 when I was working in the UK. I had discussions with a group of biogeochemists there, and they'd done an experiment in another part of the Southern Ocean to look at the effect of iron near the Crozet Islands, which are to the west of the islands I'm gonna talk about. 
They'd hypothesized that iron rich sediment was being swept up and carried to the surface by currents and that was actually feeding or nourishing the phytoplankton. Well, as a geologist, I knew there were active volcanoes both around that island and around other islands in the Southern Ocean. So I said, well, an alternative hypothesis would be that the volcanoes are pumping the iron into the water column just by cooling activity as opposed to their sediment being swept up and carrying the iron. So between 2012 and 2013, we wrote a series of proposals, submitted them, some of which were funded, some weren't, um, and we were able to do the project. We got a voyage funded in 2016, a two month voyage to go and collect the data and samples we needed. And then for the last four years, we've been working on analyzing, interpreting and publishing those data. So this is a snapshot of the Southern Indian Ocean, actually a five year composite of chlorophyll. Now, how do we know what chlorophyll is throughout the ocean? Well, satellites, <clears throat> determine something called ocean color. And that ocean color is a proxy for um, chlorophyll. And in this color scheme here, the blue is essentially anemic. There's no iron or no chlorophyll, which means very little iron because the, the phytoplankton who produce the chlorophyll need the iron. And then the red spots are <clears throat> areas where there are very high concentration of chlorophyll, hence phytoplankton, hence iron. And we're going to that brightest of red spots in the Southern Ocean, southwest of Australia, uh, to take a look at the volcanoes there and what's happening in the water column with the iron and the phytoplankton. When we think of volcanism around the earth, there are two major, three major types of volcanism. There's the ring of fire around the Pacific to the left, you see all those little notches on the plate boundaries that are subducting. That produces one kind of volcano. And then at mid-ocean ridges, which are the red um, areas on this diagram, you see, or the red lines, uh, that's where tectonic plates are spreading apart. But there's another type of volcanism, which we call hotspot volcanism, which occurs in the middle of tectonic plates. And the quintessential example of that is Hawaii, uh, where you have a very active volcano in the middle of a plate. But there are two other really active hotspot volcanoes on the surface of the Earth. And those, both of those are in the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> One is Réunion, a French island just off the coast of Madagascar, and then Heard Island, which is where we're going. We don't know very much about Heard. Hawaii and Réunion are very well studied. Heard is very poorly studied. So yet another reason to, to go there. So this map shows essentially where we are. Uh, it's about 4,000 kilometers from Australia, it's about 4,000 kilometers from South Africa, and about 1,600 kilometers north of Antarctica. So one of the more isolated places on Earth. And France owns the Kerguelen Islands and maintains a year-round base there. Australia owns Heard and McDonnell Islands, um, and there's no permanent or even temporary station there. And there hasn't been since the 1950s. So just homing in on this part of the ocean, Kerguelen Islands and Heard and McDonald Islands sit on the top of a large submarine plateau that rises 2,000 meters above the ambient seafloor to the northeast and the southwest. Um, Kerguelen Islands are about the same size as Iceland, so just slightly <clears throat> under um, 10,000 square kilometers. Heard Island is much, much smaller and McDonald Island is tiny, only a couple square kilometers. But there are a number of submarine banks between the two, and these have all been dredged. Uh, rocks have been recovered from these, and they're all sort of the same composition, <clears throat> um, and they're volcanic. So we know there's a lot of volcanic activity on this part of the feature. And in fact, this whole Kerguelen Plateau was created by massive volcanism. The ship we used was Australia's relatively new vessel, the Investigator. Um, <clears throat> it was commissioned in 2016 on our voyage um, and has been in operation ever since for about 300 days a year. Uh, very modern, uh, state-of-the-art technology aboard. The ship is so capable, it, it acquires about 500 different kinds of data continuously from atmospheric data to clean water coming aboard 
Um, but I'll be focusing in this talk on some specialized equipment that we used. We had a very multidisciplinary science party. We had geoscientists and our main, uh, which I am, and our main purpose was to map the seafloor and identify um, submarine volcanoes or volcanoes on the seafloor and their associated cooling or hydrothermal systems. We had biogeochemists and their main task was to measure iron and other trace metals in the water column. We had physical oceanographers who mapped ocean circulation. So once you get the iron into the water column, where does it go to? We needed to know that. And then we had ecologists and biopticians aboard to determine the primary productivity and what types of um, animals and plants were actually present in the study area. All told on the ship, we had 26 scientists and that included 10 PhD students and two master's students. We had 10 science support staff. And for the first time in my career, we took artists aboard. We had five artists. We had a choreographer slash dancer um, and several photographers, uh, videographers, and we had a visual artist, someone who draws. And they were very active during the whole voyage. And <clears throat> if you're interested after the seminar, I can talk a bit more about the art. 20 ships crew, and it was like a mini United Nations. We had 14 different nationalities. So what kind of data do we collect? So in terms of the geoscience data or the geology and geophysics data, we had a number of different acoustic systems that send sound down through the water, um, down into the seafloor and coming back, a deep water system, a shallow water system, systems to look at the water column, uh, which look at things like fish, and a sub-bottom profile, which actually looks into the seafloor and is reflected off layers in the sediment and rock beneath the seafloor. And then to calibrate all this, we had to know the thermal and salinity structure of the water column itself. So we deployed what are called bathythermographs every two a day to measure the properties of the water so we could correct the travel time uh, that <clears throat> the acoustics measured into true depth of the water. In terms of geology, we dredge the seafloor, and that's dragging a rock um, dredge, which is essentially a chain with teeth on the front of it that just very low technology, just drag it along the seafloor and hope you get some rocks in it. We grab samplers that scoop up sediment. And with these samples, we measured the elemental composition, um, stable isotopes we did ashore, both radiogenic and stable isotopes. Uh, we were able to measure helium, which turns out to be important, and we did some spectroscopy on the rocks. In terms of photography, we had a deep tow camera system that we could tow off the back of the ship along the seafloor to image what the seafloor looked like. And then we circumnavigated these islands the first time scientifically that that had ever been done, believe it or not. And so we have a great photographic record of these two islands. In terms of biogeochemistry, we deployed a trace metal rosette. Iron you measure in parts per million in the ocean. So this trace metal rosette could not have anything iron containing on it. So it was constructed of plastic and titanium. And to isolate it from any contamination, we had to keep it away from anything that had iron. Uh, we put pumps near the seafloor where we pumped large volumes of water through these collected particulate matter on filters. The ship had a clean water supply and from that we could measure salinity, nutrients, and do incubations, measure sulfide, oxygen, do all kinds of um, measurements on the water that came aboard. And we did a lot of that ashore as well with regards to radiogenic isotopes. And then in terms of physical oceanography, ecology, and biooptics, we did CTDs, which are conductivity temperature depth profiles. This involves lowering an instrument over the side of the ship all the way down to the seafloor, and along the way, taking continuous measurements of what the conductivity, which is a proxy for salinity, what the temperature and what the depth were. We deployed Argo floats uh, and also SOCOM floats. I can get into that later if you're curious. Um, there are many of these floats in the ocean to, that do sort of vertical profiling. They're autonomous, they're robots. Um, we deployed drifters for NOAA, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. We put down ADCPs or current profilers, and we towed a 
what was called triaxis, which is a Toyo device, a device behind the ship that goes up and down, sort of in a yo-yo fashion behind the ship that also does conductivity, conductivity, temperature, depth measurements, and other measurements as well. In terms of ecology, we were interested in doing identification of species. And then back ashore, we did metatranscriptomics um, <clears throat> that tried to determine how accessible the iron in the water column was and how the organisms actually use that iron in their metabolic functions. And then we had a bio-optician aboard uh, and deployed a bio-optical package over the side of the ship to look at things like fluorescence, radiometry, backscatter, attenuation, and absorption. So as I said, many different kinds of data being collected and measurements being made and samples being collected while we're at sea. So we left Western Australia. Perth um, is the nearby city to Fremantle, which is its port in early January, four years ago, made our way down to the islands, which takes over a week and worked around the islands for quite a few weeks. Um, and then <clears throat> had to leave about 10 days early because we had a medical emergency on the ship. So we started hightailing back towards the nearest hospital, which is again, eight days away. Um, the patient improved um, partway there. And so we decided to head for Hobart, which is way over on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, <clears throat> but then the patient deteriorated and we had to head straight into Albany in Western Australia and drop the patient off there. The happy ending to this story is the patient, when we finally got back to Hobart, greeted us on the dock, all recovered and all smiles. So these two islands are World Heritage listed for both ecological and ge geological reasons. reasons. They're among the only islands in the sub-Antarctic that haven't been populated by invasive species, whether it be flora or fauna. So there's no rats, there's no rabbits, there are no feral cats like on most sub-Antarctic islands. So they're really pristine islands and we had to follow very strict environmental protocols because the marine area within 12 nautical miles of these islands is also very well protected and managed. So this is a map of Heard Islands, the, the Big Island, and then Tiny McDonnell Island in the upper right hand corner of the diagram. So it's a big volcano. It's 9,000 feet tall, so nearly twice as tall as Katahdin in Maine. And essentially the island is one big volcano and then a little subsidiary volcano off to the northwest. And 40 years ago, this island was 90% glaciated. Now it's only about 70% glaciated. Uh, climate change is drastically reducing the extent of the glaciers on this island. So the location of the islands in the center right hand side of this is Heard Island and over on the center left is McDonald Island and the black dots and numbers just indicate where we did sampling, whether it was water column sampling or seafloor sampling, both are interesting. So we collected eight successful dredges where we recovered rock from the seafloor and eight successful grabs where we grabbed sediment off the seafloor. And this is a picture of the big volcano on Heard Island. It's called Big Ben. And the very top of it is called Mawson Peak that's erupting here. You can see the smoke coming out and tailing off to the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, we can actually see lava flows flowing over the top of the glacier, generating this steam, and then diving beneath in the lower left-hand side, diving beneath the glacier. So very active volcano. Every time a ship goes by there, the volcano seems to be erupting when you can see it. The problem with monitoring herd from satellites is that cloud and shrouds it 360 out of 365 days a year. So it's a very difficult volcano to monitor from satellites because you just can't see it through the clouds. But as I said, whenever a ship's there, it appears to be erupting at least sporadically. And we were extremely fortunate to see this eruption in action. So I'm going to show you some data now. We, we discovered flares coming out of the seafloor in our acoustic data <clears throat> um, in many places around the island, but I'm going to home in on these two red boxes here, one just north of Heard Island and one sort of northeast of McDonald Island. 
Overall, we saw 244 flares. So they're in water depths. The water is quite shallow um, by blue water oceanography standards, only 50 to 150 meters. And these averaged 30 meters above the seafloor. And some images of these are on the left. The ones up on the top of the figure are from McDonald Island. McDonald Island on the lower left, and then Heard Island on the <coughs> center, um, lower part of the center screen. And black is essentially the seafloor, and everything you see in color, whether it's blue, green, or red, are these flares that are coming out of the seafloor. We had some initial discussions with the biologists aboard said, how do you know those are geological? What do you, what do you think those, you think it might be life? And we did see features that instead of vertical like this, they were more horizontal. And we knew those were either schools of plankton or krill or fish with air bladders because the acoustics would sense those as well. But we convinced the biologists by eventually saying, well, unless these are whales that are standing on their heads, they're most likely geological. So we ran rings around the islands, as I said. This is our bathymetry in color here around Heard Island in the center. Um, <clears throat> and the area where we saw the most of these um, flares were off to the northeast of the island, um, where this densest spot of black dots is. But first, I'll talk a bit about the rocks we recovered. We dredged rocks from this undersea volcano. You can also ask, actually see a little crater up in the upper le left-hand corner. And we were able to radiometrically date these rocks and the rocks were just over 7,000 years old. And that's young geologically. Um, we consider anything under 100,000 to be an active volcano. So this is an active volcano north of Heard Island. We also were able to date rocks both on the island and <clears throat> um, offshore. And the youngest rocks we found, aside from seeing them erupt on the top of the island, were about 2,000 years old and going clockwise around the island, generally less than 5,000. And then somewhat older rocks over here on the western part of the island, 50,000 years old. And you can see as we photograph these on the island, on the lower left here, we see very active cinder cones essentially or subsidiary volcanoes. So it's a very active volcanic regime on this island. The flares here in a bit more detail, again, black is the seafloor and all these um, colored entities or flares that are coming off. You can see they vary enormously in size, vertical extent, width, et cetera. And in fact, we steamed over several of them um, multiple times and their character changed. Um, so they aren't steady state features, they're um, time varying uh, features. And then we put the camera down to the seafloor and what we saw north of Hurdon were actually bubbles coming out of the seafloor. And you see in this center figure, a bubble train that's uh, being emanated from the seafloor here. And this is what's creating those acoustic flares. So the acoustics actually is a <clears throat> product of, the acoustic impedance is a product of density times velocity. And since the density and velocity of air or whatever's in these bubbles is so much less than the water, then they produce in a, an acoustic response. And we saw bubbles coming out in quite a few locations. We saw discolored seafloor in the area that these bubbles were emanating from. And we also saw fairly dense life. We saw these sea stars you can see in the center image and we saw other life around these. So whatever's coming out of the seafloor is generating sort of a unique biogeochemical environment. Um, these are probably algal mats here um, that are somehow feeding off what's ever coming. And this led us to believe that there's actually methane coming out of the seafloor here, not carbon dioxide. So, as I mentioned, a lot of herd is still glaciated and we're in an interglacial period now between ice ages. Well, during the last ice age, the glaciers emanating from herd covered a much larger area. So the reconstructed grounding line, um, much like when Maine was glaciated um, 20,000 years ago, the grounding line was far out in the Gulf of Maine uh, 
we see this blue line encircling Heard and McDonnell Islands was actually the extent of the um, glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. And then the glacier had to drain somehow when it melted and these white dotted lines show essentially where the glacier, um, glacial water actually flowed away from the, the main glacier. So 20,000 years ago, we know the volcanoes were active then. We've seen that, that age um, in the volcanoes. So there was volcanism going on simultaneously with the last ice age and then <clears throat> generating um, a much larger um, glacial ice interaction at that time. So just to summarize our observations geological around Heard Island, we saw many of these flares. We saw gas bubbles coming out of the sea floor. We saw these microbial mats. However, we didn't measure any temperature anomalies associated with these bubbles, although we couldn't get that close to them. Um, underneath, which I'm not going into in this talk, we saw actually indications in the subsea floor that there were gas pockets. And also something I'm not going to talk about is we saw some sort of coupling between carbon and sulfate in the vicinity of these from the grab samples we took. And very diverse um, ecosystem around um, these flares. So <clears throat> moving over to McDonald Island now, we found a lot, all these little bumps on the seafloor are volcanoes uh, around the black mass at the center, which is McDonald Island. And then the black dots are sampling locations. And we were also able to date the volcanic rocks uh, using argon-argon radiometric dating technique. Rocks we dredged yielded ages from around 50,000 years old to around 12,000 years old. But McDonald Island is also an active volcano, so <clears throat> uh, it's probably just as active as Heard is. I'm going to focus in on a couple of the areas where we did more detailed sampling. You can see the wonderful shape of these volcanoes to the south and to the west and to the north that have little craters on top. So you can almost imagine these um, two of these erupting right now. So homing in on those red boxes, more acoustic flares being emanated, some of these from the crest of what appears to be a small volcano. And to summarize our observations there, uh, we tried, we deployed the deep tail camera system there, but unfortunately <clears throat> the water was so turbid we couldn't see. It was like driving in Maine through a blizzard. You, you just couldn't see more than a few feet or meters ahead of you. Um, so we abandoned efforts with the deep tail camera. So we infer that they're being created by bubbles, these flares. We didn't see any microbial mats on our grab samplers. Again, no temperature anomalies, so there wasn't hot water coming out of the seafloor, at least as much as we could measure it. Uh, these flares were coming out of areas where there was no sediment, very limited sulfur reduction, and a very limited biota. So these two different islands have different characteristics with regards to their um, acoustic flares. And our conclusion, initial conclusion, is it's actually carbon dioxide coming out that's associated with hydrothermal activity as opposed to methane, which we think is the source of the bubbles over on Heard Island. Another indication of hydrothermal activity is this Google Earth image. <clears throat> so the normal water color here is around the island, is well away from the island, is this dark green or blue. Once you get close into the island though, you see this much lighter water color and the currents are sweeping from west to east here. So west is up current. So even up current on this western side of the island, we see a discolored water. And if any of you have been to Yellowstone National Park and seen the many colored water there, discolored water, you'll get a fair inkling of what hydrothermal activity does to the color of water. Um, we also observed excess helium-3, an isotope of helium, which is an indicator of material coming from deep in the earth, uh, in the earth's mantle, which lies below the earth's crust. And I'll talk a bit more about that. We also saw evidence for really young volcanic activity. This is what's called a fumarole, which is where hot fluids are, and gases are coming out of the active volcano, this discolored rock, this reddish colored rock. You can also see steam coming off this island, so the rock is hot 
And people ask me what these white dots are that you see going up the slope from um, southwest to northeast here. Those are actually mountain climbing penguins. Those are king penguins who, for whatever reasons, like to climb up to the top of this island several hundred meters um, for whatever reasons. So turning a bit to the helium, the helium-3, uh, the most excessive helium-3 was over here near McDonnell Islands, although we had one reading off to the northeast of Heard Island. And again, this is an indicator of mantle um, sourced helium, which accompanies hydrothermal activity as observed at mid-ocean ridges and other hotspots, hotspot volcanoes. And we did a bunch of reference stations and this curve depth versus helium-3 on the right here shows sort of the regional trend going down to 1,000 meters, this sort of smooth curve. And then the anomalous values, which are very different, are kind of a horizontal line across the top of this. So this is how we identified background along this curve versus anomalous or excessive helium-3. And what we like to think now is that we have an underwater analog to Yellowstone here for all kinds of hydrothermal activity that is producing time varying underwater geysers probably. Um, and they're varying on the time scales of seconds to maybe even centuries and everything in between. And probably hundreds of these features around Heard and McDonnell Island. So an underwater analog to one of our great national parks. What about physical oceanography? Well, that's complicated as well in this part of the world. So we have the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, um, <clears throat> which is the world's strongest and most voluminous current flowing from west to east. We have the polar front, which lies between Kerguelen Island and Heard and McDonnell Island. And then we have a branch of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current here. And the interesting thing around Heard and McDonnell, which are kind of almost in the center of this figure, is that the Antarctic Circumpolar Current takes a sharp left-hand turn, goes off to the north-northwest, and then resumes its general eastward track here. And this throws off a lot of eddies as well. So the physical oceanography is quite complicated. <clears throat> and after looking at all our CTD data, we did 50 successful uh, conductivity temperature depth deployments, 40, trace metal rosette deployments, and we deployed the in-situ pumps 11 times. And we did these various transects as shown by the <clears throat> red dots. We found that the circulation surprisingly was dominantly tidal, somewhere between 15 and 50 centimeters a year. So sloshing back and forth across the plateau. There was a northward component that was about 10% of the tidal component. And <clears throat> the water column was extremely well mixed, the same temperature and salinity from top to bottom around these islands, although the bottom is only 150 meters down. And this is due to the strong winds, the sort of ambient winds there between 25 and 35 knots. So turning to the iron data, this is iron concentration along the horizontal axis, dissolved iron versus depth. Uh, this is a reference site, which we did well away from the islands. On the left, on the right is <clears throat> another reference station, again, well away from the islands. So this gave us an idea what the background iron concentrations were. And then plotting up all our data, uh, well away from the islands again, this transect B, um, on the upper figure on the left, we see a slight enrichment. So the scale is on the right here. The green is slightly enriched compared to the blue. A slight enrichment of iron in the near bottom waters, but generally very iron poor. Um, and these profiles on the right hand side actually show some of the iron data at the various stations. However, when we get close to the islands, we see much, much higher, order of magnitude higher concentrations of iron. On the figures on the left, we see concentrations in red here, uh, order of magnitude greater than, and extremely well mixed, so uniform iron essentially top to bottom. And then as we move away to the east, away from the islands, we see this iron rapidly decrease uh, on this transect. What about phytoplankton? <clears throat> well, this was the surprise for us. 
away from the plateau, the dominant phytoplankton were diatoms. And <clears throat> this has been well known for a long, long time. And it was dominated away from the islands by mi microplankton, which are greater than 20 micrometers in diameter. <clears throat> However, close to the islands, the community changed dramatically. They were all or dominated by nanoplankton, less than 20% microplankton. And <clears throat> these were dominated not by coccoliths, which are your typical phytoplankton, but haptophytes um, and probably this Pheocystis species. And this is the type of species, you can see them in Maine, they generate this foam. Um, they don't preserve, they don't build a house for themselves out of silica or calcium carbonate. They're, <clears throat> they're just bare. Uh, and this is a, a blow up on the lower right of what these look like under the microscope. So um, a very different kind of microbial community. And this sort of plays into my conclusions as well, which I'll get to now. There was a, there was a paradox, because um, <clears throat> we have very high iron, we have high nutrients, but low biomass. So the possible explanations for this paradox were that the biomass exists, but the satellite didn't see it. Well, we ruled that out because we actually took measurements in the water column. So the satellites weren't wrong. Uh, we ground truth to satellite data. Another idea would be that the iron is not bioavailable, that the organisms actually couldn't take it up. We've since done incubation experiments and the iron is very labile. It's very easy for organisms to take up. Vertical mixing and dilution, we rule that out with our um, sampling through the water column. Lateral mixing, no, that doesn't explain it either. Um, other limiting processes could be toxins, um, probably not. The amounts of other metals like cadmium, which can be poisonous, were not that high. Time, it takes organisms a, a set amount of time to reproduce, to double in size. That's probably not explaining it. Could it be that zooplankton are actually grazing? Well, we didn't see much evidence for zooplankton around the islands either, so that's probably not it. So the conclusion we came to that it's probably light limited. I told you how turbid the water was around McDonald Island. <clears throat> that lack of light combined with deep mixing probably explains the lack of significant biomass or a lot less than what we might have expected. So in summary, we have active hotspot volcanism on the islands and probably analogous active volcanism on the surrounding seafloor. Um, the types of iron that are going into the water here are probably both hydrothermal from these cooling volcanoes and particulate glacial iron. So these glaciers on Heard Island are, but there are none on McDonald Island. The glaciers on Heard Island are grinding up rocks as they flow downhill and that's turning into a rock flower. And if any of you have seen uh, glacial water or glacial stream in Iceland, for example, or in the Western US, Glacier National Park, you know, you'll have seen the, the color of the water coming out of these glaciers and it's, it's very iron rich and that's getting into the surface water. We think these flares are being produced by methane from around Heard Island and carbon dioxide from around McDonald. And we think we explain the lack of biomass by the lack of light that's available for the organisms to prosper. So that finishes my presentation and I thank you for your attention. I'll acknowledge the Marine National Facility in Australia, which runs this vessels. Um, the Re Australian Research Council, which is like NSF in the United States, who supported us. A collaborative research center um, involving my university, the RO, and the Antarctic Division. Uh, the Australian government. The Australia Council for the Arts supplied money for the artists to go on the vessel and then the lead institution, my University of Tasmania. So thank you. Happy to take questions now. So Mike, we've had one question come through asking um, about the artists on the ship, which I think is incredibly exciting to kind of have that art meets science aspect. From your perspective as a scientist, what did having artists participate in this expedition bring to the overall project? Was it largely to help it interpret the project for the public? Um, or was there an element of their work that contributed to the research results? Uh, the answer is both. Um, we, 
The photographers in particular really helped us document what was going on on the islands themselves. And they also helped with the interpretation of the organisms we recovered. Uh, the dredged rocks actually had organisms living on them. So those were all photographed in a highly professional manner. Uh, the, the, the visual artist and the dancer uh, turned out to be very useful on the ship because the visual artist could draw quite realistic impressions of what was going on on board and has a whole portfolio. We mounted an exhibition uh, involving all the artists that toured through Tasmania after the voyage uh, that was extremely well attended. It was put on at three different venues. And the dancer slash choreographer pr proved to be very useful on the ship scientifically because when you put down a CTD, uh, it has 36 bottles that collect water. And there are probably a dozen scientists who want to sample that water as soon as the CTD comes back on the ship. So I'd known this dancer before the voyage and I said, would you choreograph the sampling of the CTD bottles? And he said, yes. So he organized the sampling and in a rigorous choreographic fashion, he allowed people to access the bottles for sampling because all dozen scientists couldn't get to the bottles all at once. So he, so he proved really useful scientifically. As for the artistic endeavor, I've, I've always viewed both science and art as, an art, as, a creative, as creative endeavors. And I thought it would be really interesting to take ours to see how they respond to the science we're doing, but also to the incredible natural environment we're in, and how they respond to that creatively. And all of them responded um, strongly to the environment. The dancer responded in a way that I just didn't imagine before the voyage. And <clears throat> so they've taken our science to audiences that would never ever um, attend a conference that I go to or read a publication that I, I've written. So it's, it's also helped take our science to entirely new audiences. Um, so I've had another question come through. Um, given that it was summer when you were, when you were on your voyage, um, what was the weather like? You obviously have to go through the roaring 40s to get down to the islands. And those are known as some of the roughest waters in the world. Um, how did everyone cope on the ship and what was the kind of the air temp like for you, for you having to work outside on the ship? Uh, those are good questions. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Fremantle's low 30s latitude, so we had to go all the way through the roaring 40s into the furious 50s to get to the islands. And sometimes it's relatively easy going, sometimes it's really tough, but this I've been, this is my seventh, this is my sixth voyage to the, you know, this part of the world. And every previous voyage, we've had storms that have essentially halted our work. We just, we heave to, we just point the bow of the ship into the waves and turn the screws over and you're going one to two knots, just the bow, the ship is pitching a lot. Um, this was my first voyage there where we did not hit that weather. The, the winds went over 60 knots a few times, but on this size vessel, which is just over 300 feet, uh, we weren't, we were compromised in some way with actually what we could do. We couldn't put things over the side in 35 knots or more of wind, but we could always map the seafloor at a slower speed, four or five knots. So we could always work, we could always do something. And because we had so many different kinds of data and samples to acquire, uh, we didn't really lose any time to weather on this voyage. So that was really good. The ambient water temperature is between one and two degrees C around the islands. And that's about the ambient air temperature. It snowed a few times, um, but didn't stick. Um, just a light dusting on the ship. So if you get farther south, even in summer, it can get worse. And I've been farther south, but we, we were, the weather was relatively benign in my experience in that part of the world. There was also, I should mention, 2016 was something called the Southern Annular Mode. Um, and it's, it's, it's a cyclical um, climate phenomenon 
something like El Nino, uh, that <clears throat> during a southern annular mode, the winds compress, uh, the, the strongest winds compress around the continent of Antarctica. And these islands, fortunately, in 2016, lie north of the strongest winds that are um, focused around Antarctica. So we were lucky in that respect in that uh, <clears throat> we were in southern annular mode and the, the winds were calmer than they would be if it hadn't been southern annular mode. Well, I'm glad to hear that it wasn't as rough a ride as it possibly could have been. Did you have any expectations for your results? And if you did, how did you feel about what you, what you gained while you were down there? Well, we really would have liked to have seen the so-called smoking gun hydrothermal systems on the seafloor. And we have plans now to go back to actually with more and different equipment to actually try and identify uh, hot fluids coming out of the seafloor. Uh, so that was, that was a disappointment, but we found so much else that was interesting and has stimulated a lot of other thinking that um, it, it, it's, it's, been, it's been very rewarding so far. And there are, there are a lot more um, papers coming out on this. We've already published 10 papers on the data set um, and five PhD theses have come out of it. So uh, there's a lot more to come. Wonderful. Um, and then someone else has asked, given that this is an area that not many scientists have had a chance to research, um, did you discover any new species? Uh, that work is underway. Um, I can't put my finger on any new species on this particular voyage, but I was back in this part of the world this January through March, and we had um, more macrobiologists on board, and they have identified from this recent voyage about a dozen new species. Um, so, yeah, new life. Someone's asked that, I saw some lagoons on her that are glacial, I presume. Did you sample any of that water? No, uh, we didn't go ashore at all. We, we, with a ship uh, we, and with the environmental restrictions, we didn't even apply to go to shore. It would have been nice to do that, but um, the hazards of going ashore at Heard Island, and it's impossible at McDonald essentially, unless you have a helicopter. The hazards of not having a helicopter and having to rely on sea surface transportation is that the weather can change so quickly there the, and there's no protected anchorage is that the danger is that if you put people ashore and expect to get them um, a few hours later, the weather could come up so quickly that um, they might be there, they might have to stay ashore a week. So, uh, and that during that week, the ship would have to stay close, relatively co close to them to dodge in and get them and then dodge back out. So yeah, it's, it's a hazardous place to try and get ashore if you don't have a helicopter, which we didn't have. Um, one last question has come in. Let me see if I can just find it again, sorry. Okay, you spoke about that you've got further research coming up. When is that all going to happen? Some of it happened this past January through March, and <clears throat> we're writing proposals now to, to go back there. We just had one funded to actually look at the island itself, the islands themselves, in terms of their um, igneous petrology, so real geological type of study. Um, but as I said, we want to go back there. Once we get most of our results published, we'll write a proposal to go back and look for hydrothermal systems, active hydrothermal systems. But I have another, <laughs> I know, I have another voyage in the Southern Ocean this coming September, October, um, pandemic permitting on the same ship, but over uh, in the Southwest Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean. And then another voyage to that part of the ocean a year from September, October. So yeah, more voyages coming up, but <clears throat> different scientific objectives. Okay. And I've had just one last question pop in, what we've just got time for. Um, asking, does the ship have good stabilization um, or do you feel the waves? I think that might be down to an individual perspective. Uh, that's not an or question, both. So the ship does have good stabilization. It has sort of passive water. There are water tanks on both sides near the bottom of the ship and software controls the transfer of that water from one side of the ship to the other side of the ship to reduce the rolling of the ship. We had one instance 
um, where the software failed, because this was essentially a commissioning voyage in this in the furious 40s and uh, <clears throat> roaring 40s and furious 50s. So uh, the software failed and the ship keeled about 30 degrees and it stayed in that 30 degree heel for a while. And that initial heel threw three people um, causing injuries, one of them quite well, one of them, the, the woman, woman has had to have surgery a couple of times to repair a knee that got damaged by that um, particular healing incident. So in general, yeah, the ship is pretty well, pretty stable. I've been down there on a drill ship, which is nearly 500 feet long. That's much more stable, but it's a much bigger ship. But this is certainly better than a 240 foot ship I was down there on um, a couple of times. So all depends on the size of the ship, how stable it is. Mike, um, I think that's all the questions. So we'd just like to say thank you so much for sharing your fascinating research with us. Um, you know, it's a part of the world that not many of us will get to go to. Um, and the fact that you're going down there to find out more, um, there's so much we don't know. Um, we'll be back next month, everyone, on June 8th with um, a faculty member from MDI Biological Laboratory, Dr. Jared Rollins, who will explore the connection between aging and protein translation and will demonstrate a tool that is used to help him with this research. Um, you'll see things coming out over email and on our social media channels if you'd like to be involved with that one. And for those of you who are new to us, you can get, um, get updates and emails from us if you go to mdibl.org slash subscribe. So Mike, again, thank you. A fascinating topic, um, a beautiful place in the world um, where brave souls only go. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you everyone.